Yo. If, to give you a little little review, a little recap of where we've been in Hebrews, um, we've looked at Jesus is better. Jesus is better than anything you can compare him to. And he's, he's the best. Jesus is the best because he's God. We saw that in chapter 1. And he's the best because he's the man. And we saw that in chapter 2. Last week we saw that Jesus... Uh, who is like the, the, the next Adam. He's the next beginning of a new human race. He's the, he's the perfect Adam, the better man. He's not ashamed to call you his brothers. That was in chapter 2, verse 11, and we spent a little bit of time in that last week. At, uh, at a family reunion and you and Jesus show up, you are not the weird cousin that Jesus avoids. You are, you are his brother that he actually likes being with. Uh, he's proud to introduce you to his friends. Say, hey, this is, this is my little brother, and I'm Jesus. Nice to meet you. He's proud to introduce you to his friends. And we saw in verse 13 last week that, uh, of Hebrews chapter 2 that he considers you as children that are a gift from God. It says, here am I and the children whom God has given to me. And, and now I, I like this because Jesus, he fulfills all the best of our human relationships. And I've kind of mentioned this before here and there. But, you know, it says Jesus is our brother. He's our older brother. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. And in that, he has become a human just like us. He's one of our brothers descended from another human. You know, he had, he had a, a human mother who was descended from Adam and just like we are. Um, and we're both together in this thing called the human race, Jesus and us. He did it right. We do it wrong and we get to follow him. Uh, he's also like our father. In Isaiah 9, verse 6, which you hear a lot around Christmas, it says, Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders. Can't wait for that. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. That's talking about Jesus. He's like a father, a prince of peace. Uh, the child is like a father to us. Jesus is like a brother. He's like a parent as well. He pleads with Jerusalem while he was on this earth, Jesus of Nazareth, looking at Jerusalem, saying that he wanted to gather them as a mother hen gathers chicks under the wings. Jesus isn't your mom, uh, but he cares for you just as much as your mother cares for you. And he's like a parent. He's not your father, but he, and he's not God the Father. They are distinct, but he's, he's like a caring and providing father. And he's like a brother, uh, better than any brother you had, praise the Lord. Um, but all this to say is that Jesus is one of the family, or rather that you are one of his family. Jesus is one, uh, is a member of your family and you of his. And it's nice to have, it's nice to have a hero in the family. Okay, we, we're, we're familiar with heroes here. We've got this fire getting, uh, you know, cleaned up and everything like that. How many have, how many of you have a relative who is a hero? Okay. A relative who is a hero. We've got our wall out here with our bulletin board and our veterans, right? And we, because we, we like heroes. And it's, it's nice. It's, everyone likes to have someone in their family that's accomplished something of worth or done something notable or displayed the qualities of, of heroics. And then you can say, oh, yeah, I have my brother does this, my father, my grandfather, whatever. And you have a hero in the family. And like I said, we've got our bulletin board in the, in the hallway with uh, pictures of active duty uh, servicemen. And those are put there because we're proud of the heroes in our family. We just, we are. Well, God the Son became a man to do something very heroic. And he did it as your big brother. And we have a hero in the family named Jesus that we can be proud of. Um, in verses 14 through 18 of Hebrews chapter 2, that's going to be our text today. Um... Oh, we're all blessed here. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> verse, verse, yeah, you don't even have to sneeze to be blessed, really. Um, was it Seinfeld that would say, you're very good looking? That's the new response to someone sneezing. When someone sneezes, you tell them you're very good looking. Just tell them that instead. Um, verse 14 through 18, it tells us what our relative Jesus did. And what, it, what it, he did that makes him such a hero worth looking up to. Um, let's take a look at verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 2. It says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. 
and released those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Um, I don't know if you, uh, you ever, you remember being a little kid and having conversations on like the playground or whatever with other little kids with, that would go something like, well, my dad is taller than your dad. You know, my dad's bigger than your dad. It's like, oh, I don't know if that's something to be proud of. But, um, or something like that. And that kind of, that habit actually continues, I've seen into like retirement and stuff because then you just get to walk around and talk with your retired friends about your grandkids. So that never really stops, that idea of being proud of someone in your family and maybe even a little bit too proud of someone in your family because they're better than the other person. You know. But then you have someone in your, in your family that's worth bragging about and people can say all they want about their family tree, good or bad, um, but we can always come back with now, well, my, my Jesus, I have this relative, Jesus, who created the universe and he had me in mind when he did it. Your dad can be taller than my dad, that's fine with me. Uh, my big brother Jesus has angels worship him 24-7, always has. Uh, my Jesus died for my sins and yours and brings sinners into repentance, sinners uh, through repentance into the presence of God by cleansing them from all unrighteousness. And he's taller than your dad. You know? And my Jesus is better. Jesus is better. And with that as the theme of really our entire study through Hebrews, we've been seeing how Jesus is better. Let me tell you what we see Jesus trump in these five verses, 14 through 18. We see that Jesus is better than the devil. Now that should go without saying. Um, but since it is said, I believe it is worth saying. A greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. John 4.4. 4. We're going to talk about that and the, the victory that Christ has over Satan. We're also going to see um, the beginning of something that will be fully discussed in the coming chapters, and that is that Jesus is a better high priest. You can just see that in, in um, verse 7. We're not going to get into that too, too much, but he is a better high priest who makes better propitiation, and we are going to get into that this morning. That's important, and we're going to talk about that $5 word, propitiation, a little bit later. And in verse 18, we see that Jesus is a better helper who provides aid to those who are being tempted. And we're going to see that our brother Jesus, I'm going to stand still until that stops. Our brother Jesus, uh, we're going to see what he does that makes him the hero of this family. He's the hero of this family. Last week, we looked at the crown of honor that Jesus wore on the cross. And even though that was a crown of thorns that was placed on him, uh, on his head in a mocking way, it becomes a crown of honor because it was worn by the most honorable man doing the most honorable thing. Uh, and that most honorable thing, the most heroic thing in history, was that Jesus died on the cross. And the focus of this passage is on what Jesus did on the cross and why he did what he did on the cross. In verse 14, let's read it. It says, Inasmuch then as the children, that's us, we're the kids, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken in flesh and blood, that's what we're made of, right? Check the person next to you, see if they're made of flesh and blood. Um, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken in flesh and blood, he himself, that's Jesus, likewise shared in the same. He, be, he put on flesh and blood. Why? It says that through death, you can't die with a body unless you've got a body to put on, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. This is still explaining the details of the incarnation, a topic that was picked up early in chapter 2. The children, that's us, were flesh and blood. And let me know if the person next to you wasn't. Um, the ch uh, we're flesh and blood. We live in bodies. We are physical being, beings. That's the way we were created. That's by God's design. And so Jesus, in becoming our brother, in becoming one of us, has taken on the same. He is a physical being living right now in a physical glorified body. <laughs> And this verse tells us the reason why Jesus took on flesh, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. He couldn't, he couldn't die a death like ours unless 
He took on a body like ours. And this is why Jesus became a man. He came in order to die. That is the primary purpose of Christ's incarnation, was his death. That through death, he can get a whole lot done. That through death, he would defeat the enemy of our souls, that is, the devil. But he didn't just die to finish off a fight with a fallen angel. He took on the flesh and died on the cross to release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That's in verse 15. He wasn't just picking a fight with the devil. He had you in mind, the ones captive through fear of death, the ones under the curse. That's us. And in verse 18, it says, He himself has suffered being tempted. He is also able to uh, aid those who are tempted. Um, so his heroic act wasn't just a fight against Satan, but an act of love for us. So we see two reasons, at least for the cross, but that's not all. We're going to look at three today. Back in verse 17, um, it says that he was made like his brethren to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Uh, propitiation, that big word, it's payment for sin. And the doctrine surrounding this is called substitutionary atonement. What that is, is Jesus offering himself to God, not to Satan, not to you, but to God as the perfect sacrifice so that God's holy wrath could be quenched in Jesus instead of on you. This is the heroic act of Jesus, and it goes in a few different directions. Uh, our hero is like, he's not just a firefighter, he's like a firefighter, marine, police officer, astronaut. Like, he does, he does it all. Like, he does everything heroic you can think of, you know? And uh, in this verse, we see the cross, the, the heroism of the cross outlined for us. Okay, picture the cross. Shouldn't be too hard to picture, okay? It hasn't changed shape in a long time. Um, it goes in four different directions, right? It points down, it points up, and it points left or right or it points out. Okay, it points, the cross points down um, to Satan. The cross defeats Satan. The cross is where the serpent's head is bruised, if you go back to Genesis 3. The cross points out, left and right, to those he is not ashamed to call brethren. And the cross points up to satisfy divine justice and mercy. We're going to look at each direction in this passage, because they're all covered here conveniently, starting with the bottom. The cross faces down, defeating the devil. In verse 14, which we already read, it says that Jesus, through death, destroyed him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. This, uh, this truth was really emphasized in the early church. During the first few centuries of the church, this is, this is what they held up. Um, as, a, as you know, one of the most important doctrines. It, it gained its own Latin name because all the good stuff did. Uh, this is Christus Victor. And you can just kind of read that right into English. Christ is the victor. That's the name of this doctrine, okay? Christ is the victor. He wins. It's a, a Christ the conqueror, Christus Victor. The idea here is that Satan had the power of death, which is exactly what it says in our text, that death and destruction and the horrors of humanity really do have their root in a demonic, satanic reality. You can read the book of Job and you see how Satan himself asked God's permission to take life and it was granted to him. And he asked God uh, for permission to torment and that was granted to him. Satan is borrowing power, but it is power he has. And it was man, Adam, that really gave that power uh, to Satan in the first place. Uh, gave it to him in the sense that he opened a door for Satan to step in. Uh, the sin in the garden gave Satan a foothold in humanity. And the things that he promotes, death, separation from God, murder, uh, these things run rampant in our world. Um, but because it was a man, it was Adam who allowed this to take place initially, it is fitting that a man, Jesus, our second Adam, would correct this mistake. And since the Garden of Eden, since the beginning, Satan has had the goal of dishonoring God through harming mankind and harming mankind by separating him from God. That's his goal. That's his objective. He wants God to be mocked, and humans are the prime tool for that mocking. We're so good at making a mockery of things. So his desire to cor um, corrupt, to, to uh, steal, kill, and destroy, excuse me, it says in John 10.10, 10, 
That's what he's into. Peter says that he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's not a match for you and me, on you and I on our own. Uh, but let's get this straight. Jesus is better than Satan. He's better. Colossians chapter 2, it says how uh, Jesus had forgiven us. And in Colossians 2.14, it says that he wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Okay, principalities and powers. That's, um, these are references to demonic forces that are at work in the world. Principalities and powers. In Ephesians, it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Okay, the, the, the battle is spiritual. So they have been made a public specta spectacle, Colossians 2.14 says, at the cross. The carpet was pulled out under Satan's feet. How did this happen? Well, I'll tell you. Um, you hear that part in Colossians 2.14 where it says Jesus wiped out the handwriting of requirements against us. That's, that's a reference to the law. The law points out our failure. You read the, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and you know you don't have a chance. Okay, The law points out our failure, and what that does is it arms Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren, with all the ammunition he needs to condemn you and to condemn me. Now listen, he, he's a liar. Jesus says he's the, he's the father of lies. Okay, He lies, but he doesn't have to lie in order to condemn us, right? He doesn't have to make anything up against you. Like what? That would be a waste of his time. I've sinned enough on my own. He doesn't need to make up new ones. Okay? He's got that handwriting of requirements, the law, which God wrote with his own hand, that handwriting of requirements that are against us and contrary to us because we've messed up. We have fallen short of the glory of God. And the law proves this to be the case. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56, it says, The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. Now, this is important. The sting of death is sin. What does that mean? It means that death, our physical death, is only bad and terrifying and scary when you separate it from the idea of it being a gateway to eternal paradise. Okay, the sting of death is sin, meaning when there's sin in the world, death is scary. And death for a sinner is scary. And death has a sting because of sin. Okay, um, if a person dies in sin that is separated from God, then death only brings them into further separation. And the sting of dying is not softened by death. It's only increased. Sin makes death scary because it is sin that separates from the reality of heaven, the heaven that is the presence of God. Now, if you don't know what happens next, um, then, of course, it, it stings. You know, you don't know what's after death. But there is, uh, because there is sin in our world and sin in our race and sin in our very DNA as a race of humans, death has a sting. It just, it just does. We don't want to die. That's natural. Okay. But then it says the strength of sin is the law. Well, what's that about? What this means is that we know we're sinners because the law points out our imperfections and sets them against the backdrop of the holiness of God. Uh, if, you, if all you had was Exodus, you'd be afraid to die, let me tell you. Okay, you read that book, you're like, oh, I don't think this is happy. Okay, um, that's, that's for sure. So the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But the verse in Ephesians 15, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15, goes further and says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory, Christus Victor, gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ wins. That fear of death, that strength of, the, of sin, that is, that's been wiped out. That handwriting of requirements has been wiped out because when Jesus died, all the accusations of you broke that law, you broke that law, you broke that law, he could answer and say, no, I didn't. I didn't break any law. So that law has been fulfilled. It's completely fulfilled. You cannot come against my brothers and sisters, my church, with a law by saying that you, they broke that one, they broke that one, they broke that one. It doesn't matter. They're in me, and I kept them all. Satan no longer has power or authority to come against a believer and condemn you for your sin. Your sin has been dealt with. Amen. It's already done. It's a done deal. He cannot do that. He is, he is helpless to come against you and accuse you of your sin. He can lie now, but it's not true. That sin has been dealt with. 
1 John 3, verse 8, it says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy sin and to destroy the ammunition that Satan uses to accuse you and to condemn you. When he nailed our accusations on the cross by taking them on himself, he left the accuser helpless to defeat you. Satan can no longer accuse forgiven people. Um, he can come against. He cannot come against you because of your sins. Jesus Christ has put to death sin, and since sin is done away with, so is the sting of death. Through death, he destroyed them who had the power of death. That is the devil. That's our verse back in Hebrews fourteen two fourteen. So where does Satan stand at this point? Well, he stands on impending doom, trying to take as many people down with him, and he still can lie. He can still tell you anything he wants. He can still tell you that, well, I saw you mess up, God doesn't like you anymore. But those are nothing but lies. Your sin has been dealt with. It's done away with. He stands on impending doom. His destiny is confirmed in the only thing that doesn't change, our Bibles. Revelation 20 verse 10 says that the devil will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone and be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan reads his Bible. Look how he tempts Jesus in the wilderness. Satan knows the scripture. He knows how it ends. He loses. Jesus wins. And that victory was gained on the cross. The cross points downward to defeat the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. But the cross also reaches out. Jesus, arms stretched on the cross, reaches to his fellow humans. In verse 15, it says, and he released those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Without resurrection, it's all hopeless, right? Paul says that if Christ isn't risen from the dead, then we are of all men the most pitiable, us Christians. But really, if death is the end, then the entire human race, Christian or not, is in a pretty bad place. Uh, fearing death, we are subject to bondage for all our lives. But because Jesus is risen from the dead, and made Paul's statement true that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, then we have nothing to fear. Paul says that neither life nor death can separate us from the love of God. And that love is made known, known by God, known to us by God on the cross. 1 John 4, 9 says, In this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, and that we might live through him. That's love. God has reached outward, not just downward, in order to show us what love is. Romans 5, 8, excuse me, says God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God has demonstrated, he has shown love. Oh, you want to see the love exhibit? Okay, learn about all these things. Well, I want to know what love is, so I'm going to go to that. Oh, it's the cross. That's what love is. That's how you learn about love. The cross defeated Satan, but it wasn't just to settle a score. Okay, it wasn't just an arm wrestling match or something. It was to show us just how much God loves us. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That love has transcend, that transcends life and death, neither life nor death can separate us from the love of God, that has been revealed to us and will be continued to be revealed to us throughout all eternity. It's an everlasting love. And because we know that death is not the end, we are freed from the fear of death and can now have courage to live like Christ. Now see, the sideways reach of the cross is not only for us in the sense that it forgives our sins and, and relieves us from the fear of death and, and showing us the love of God. It reaches out in two directions, right? Okay, So it, it reaches out to us and brings us in and forgives us and shows us love. But it also uh, gives us an example of how to live our own fear-free lives. It brings us in and sends us out. 1 John 3.16, 1 John, not John 3.16, you guys know that one. 1 John 3.16, it says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. The cross is our example of selfless living. 1 Peter 2.21, a lot of cross references today. You guys get your second pins out, you're out of ink in your first ones. 1 Peter 2.21 says, For to this you were called, 
Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So the cross reaches out. It, it to reaches out freeing us from the fear of death, showing us the love of God, inviting us to take up our cross to follow Jesus. And it gains, because it defeats the power of the devil, it gives us the power to do just those things. It gives us a place to stand and follow Christ. The cross has a profound effect on Satan. It had a profound effect on Satan and continues to do so. The cross has a profound effect on man. This is the power of God to our salvation. But the cross also has a profound effect on God himself. After all, he's the one who died on it. And he's the one for whom the sacrifice was for. You can take these uh, first two truths we've discussed, God's victory over the devil, and the lesson that the cross teaches us about love um, and how it reaches out and forgives us. But you don't understand how any of that works without the upward pointing cro cross. You don't have the whole picture until you see that the cross points towards God. Um, there, I've mentioned this bit of bad theology before once or, once or twice, but there is a, a theology that goes something like this. Jesus died to satisfy Satan, who was pleased to see Jesus die instead of you. Uh, if you read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, that's what's actually presented, right? The white witch, she's the, she's the bad guy, and she's the one who the sacrifice is for. Great book, shaky view on its atonement. Okay, this is wrong. Others take the second truth, that, um, that outward reach of the cross and say that that's really all the cross was supposed to accomplish. That it's just an example for us to follow. That Jesus, the political and humanitarian revolutionary, sacrificed himself just to teach us a lesson on how to be nice or something like that. I don't even know. I don't know how you would finish that sentence, but that's ridiculous. Without this third point, without the understanding of an upward pointing cross, the other two truths have no meaning, or at least they have no framework within to work. The third point is the how of atonement. It's, it's the how of the cross. It's how, did he, how was he victorious over Satan? How did God show his love? How does God show his love? How did God defeat Satan? By becoming the sacrifice for sin. And that's where the cross points upward. Read verse 16 and 17 with me. Um, verse 16 is kind of a a tag to an earlier passage, but we'll discuss it in, in its turn. Verse 16 says, For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Um, this bit about God not aiding angels goes back to earlier passages. The seed of Abraham that receives special blessing from God is Jesus. In Galatians, it, it points out that the seed is singular. Uh, Jesus is the seed of Abraham. All the promises of the Old Testament, they're yes and amen in Jesus. Um, but the thing in these verses that I'd really like to focus on is the word propitiation. This is the word that indicates the upward pointing of the cross. The word propitiation is important, and it means to appease an offended party. Okay, um, This is the idea that Jesus took our place, that substitution, and satisfied the wrath of God by taking the punishment that we deserve. Okay. We see this in passages like Galatians 3 verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. He took on sin. 1 John 2 verse 2 says very clearly, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not, only our, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. 1 John 4 verse 10, which we quoted before in part, says, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And there are others. Uh, there's, this is one of the most, most dearly held doctrines of Orthodox Christianity. That sin needs to be judged. That we are sinners. But that instead of receiving our punishment, which would be just, 
we are allowed the option of substituting Christ. He said, I'll take your place, I'll take the punishment, and we put him in our place, and he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Substitutionary atonement is so central to Christianity, to our faith, and so closely held that without it, the entire meaning of the cross and the mission of Jesus crumbles. Why did he, why did he come? Because he needed to teach Satan a lesson? Really, he made him. He can evaporate him. That's not, that's not a fair fight, really. Did he come just to teach us a lesson? Why didn't he just write a book? You know? Um, did, he, did he come uh, just because, you know, he, he didn't know about the cross. He was just some nice guy who was a preacher, and then the cross is like, you know, we can paint pictures of it and be happy, have fun on the weekends. Um, no. Without substitutionary atonement, the cross doesn't make any sense. Um, did Jesus die that horrible death just to teach us a lesson about love? That's crazy. Um, but he did die because he is a willing and merciful Savior, unwilling that any should perish, but that all should have eternal life. Yes. That's, why the, what, that's what the cross is about. And this is why the cross is so central to our faith and why it is the power of God for, to those of us who believe, as 1 Corinthians 1.18 says. Because the cross points upwards, uh, just like the rainbow, just like a rainbow, okay, um, stay with me here. God, uh, when God judges the world with a flood, right, Noah and company, and uh, afterwards, the, the whole world is judged. It's not a little kid's story. I don't know, uh, the animals make it fun or something, but the entire population of the planet dies, except Noah and his family. And after that, I'm sure the fear of God was fresh in the mind of Noah, having just witnessed judgment in the, the greatest capacity that this world has ever seen. And when he gets off the boat, God, uh, he saves Noah and his family, and afterward God promises that he would never again flood the whole earth like that. Never again. And then he, he swears it, and he, gives, he signs his name kind of in a way. He, sign, you know, he, he gives a, a sign that this is a covenant, this is a real thing, I promise. And it says that he hung up his bow in the sky. That's the rainbow, right? Uh, the rainbow, or in Hebrew, it's even a war bow, okay? It's not just like something pretty that comes on unicorns, okay? It's, it's a war bow. It's just really colorful. The rainbow, which is a promise that God will withhold judgment. Now, let me ask you, which day, way does the bow, that war bow, point? No, it points up. It doesn't point down. It point, if you're shooting a bow, an arrow, oh, yeah. it points up, Okay? Yes, towards heaven. God says, I promise to withhold judgment and I'm hanging up my bow. I'm not going to war anymore. But it's still pointed somewhere, isn't it? It's pointed up. Because next time I judge the whole world, next time I judge every sin that's ever been committed, the arrow is going towards me. I'll take the hit. You like rainbows now more, don't you? It's going towards heaven. God withholds judgment from his children because judgment was had on his only begotten son and the heart of heaven was broken. The cross points upward. The cross points outward to us and the cross points downward. Now, it's, it's kind of ironic because um, there have been disagreements and factions within the church because we're good at that, you know. And uh, there, there have been groups that argue about these three elements of the cross. And they'll call them theories of atonement. Okay? Different theories of atonement. And there are people who have a problem even with mentioning the idea of wrath. So they'll veer towards the other theory. Well, well, he died on the cross to defeat Satan. It says it in the Bible. You're right, it does. Or, well, God died on the cross because he wanted to show us love. Well, that's true. And it's none of this wrath stuff. Well, none of that makes sense without the wrath stuff. And some people want to veer away from that idea of judgment of sin. You know, the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, PCUSA, which is completely different than the PCA. They love acronyms in the Presbyterian churches. Um, the Presbyterian Church of America, PCA, is much more conservative than the PCUSA. But the PCUSA, they won't sing the song In Christ Alone anymore. In Christ alone, my hope is found. That one, you know. Um, they won't sing it because it has the line, the wrath of God was satisfied. And they won't sing it. Um, one of the members of the committee that made that decision 
said that the reason was because the song mistakenly expressed the view that the cross is about God's need to assuage God's anger. So basically, they're throwing out the idea of substitutionary atonement entirely and in, in favor of perhaps Christus Victor, God's victory over sin and death, or maybe something else. Now, on the other side of things, you've got well-meaning people who want to guard against bad doctrine and want to protect these correct doctrines, and they've sort of accidentally thrown out the beautiful doctrine of Christus Victor in favor of substitutionary atonement. Or they throw out the idea of, well, the cross does have a moral influence on us. That is our example to follow. And this is reaching towards us, but they, they want to you know, hold on to substitutionary atonement so much, and they throw out people and everyone else in that. And people have come to this weird conclusion that you actually have to choose one over the other. You don't. <laughs> uh, this is something that makes, um, you know, we're, we're not the only good church, obviously. Uh, but it, it makes me happy to go to Calvary Chapel. Um, makes it kind of a cool place to go to church because people make a system and then we find a way out of it. That seems to be kind of our, our way of doing things. Well, are you guys Calvinist or Arminius? Nope. Don't you dare label me with either of those nasty titles. <laughs> Um, I do not accept either label. Well, which theory of atonement do you adhere to? I don't see any reason to throw any of them out. I see them all in the word of God, and we're not to be limited to doctrinal borders and draw lines where there are none. Why did Jesus die? Well, let me tell you. He died to destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. That's what my Bible says. That's why Jesus died. And he did this by making propitiation for the sins of the people. He does it all. And when we see this happen, when we see God defeat Satan by sacrificing himself to assuage the wrath of God, it displays divine love with crystal clarity and provides us with assurance of God's love towards us as well as an example for us to follow so we can love other people the way Jesus loved us. It's not an either or proposition. It's a both and, and we can rejoice in the manifold grace of God we see expressed in the cross. Okay, you're still picturing the cross, right? Shouldn't be too hard. You haven't forgot what it looks like yet. It's one structure. It's pointing in different directions. The cross pointing down is really why or what Jesus did on the cross. He did defeat sin and death. I mean, that, that was necessary for our salvation, right? Because we're the ones who sin. And he defeated sin and death on the cross. He became the conqueror. He is victorious. But the ingredients for that victory are provided in the upward direction of the cross. Death was defeated because the wrath of God was appeased by a perfect sacrifice. Because Jesus became a substitute, Satan was defeated. Substitutionary atonement is the how of the cross. It's how the whole thing works. How did you get saved? Well, because Jesus took my place. That's how it works. The substitute. And then the, the moral example that's given to us, God, the love of God demonstrated for us by Christ laying down his life for his friends, that's the outward reach of the cross. And that's what we, um, and that lets us know what we do about it. It's the what now of the cross. Well, we love as Christ loved. And we tell people about Christ's love. We reach out as Christ reached out. We receive the free gift of forgiveness purchased for us by Christ's death. We accept victory over the enemy. He cannot condemn you. Your sin has already been dealt with. Uh, the victory gained for us by Christ. And we live our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit as Christians, little Christs, laying down our lives for each other, picking up our crosses, bearing each other's burdens, and following him. Now, there's this one last little verse in chapter 2 that kind of wraps things up nicely as we look to our hero, Jesus. Verse 18 says, For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Jesus became a man to undo the curse that is on man, to defeat Satan. He became a man so he could be punished for the sins of man. He became a man to show us what man is supposed to look like, because we don't know looking at each other. And all of this suffering, all of this work that Jesus did on the cross, uh, this work of a hero, was done to help you. And that's what hero heroes do. They help. They find the weak and the needy or the lady that's tied to the railroad tracks and they help. They go and save. Saving is synonymous with heroics. And that's what Jesus did. 
um, Jesus did his work on the cross to help, to aid those who are being tempted. Now let me ask you, have you been discouraged by the works of the devil? Let's call it what it is. Have you been caught in spiritual warfare and feel like you're losing ground? Hey, guess what? Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. He's better than that. He's so much better than that. Do you feel like you're fighting against darkness? Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the, the principalities and powers that Jesus has already put to an open shame, Colossians 2.14. Um, Jesus is in a, a, a fight with Satan, and he won. And you're on the winning team. And he can encourage you. My words can only do so much. But Jesus suffered with you. Um, you bet there was spiritual warfare on the cross. He suffered with you so that he is able to aid those who are being tempted. Tempted to discouragement. He can encourage you. When you are tempted to throw in the towel, Jesus can be there. When you are tempted to accept defeat and just let your dead sin nature have its way. Jesus is there and can aid those who are tempted because Jesus is the victor. And the cross points downward. And the cross points upward. Perhaps your spiritual depression is faced uh, the wrong way. <laughs> and you're, you're worried that God is against you. And you're worried about the devil being, or you're more worried about God being against you than you are against Satan being against you. Perhaps you're overactive conscience has you convinced that God can't be happy with you after all you've done. He can't. He can't forgive all those sins. Let me tell you, the cross gains God's favor on your behalf. You're right. God doesn't love you because of your sin. <laughs> don't, don't assume he does. Uh, but your sin has been dealt with, and the cross points upward, and, be, and because he became sin, you become righteousness. And you don't have to fear. And if you're discouraged, you're tempted to believe the lie that God is unhappy with you because of something you did yesterday. Jesus has suffered with you. He, he prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And having been there, he can come to the aid of those who are being tempted. That sin is gone. If you're struggling with either of those things, whether you feel oppressed by darkness or afraid of the light, please let me pray for you. Uh, I'm going to close in prayer and I will... Pray for all of us, but um, feel free to come up afterwards and receive prayer. Or, and if that's not you, then I just want you to know that we have every reason to rejoice in the cross as we see victory, love, and sacrifice in Jesus, who is better, and he's my hero. Amen. Let's pray. God, I lift up this church to you in Christ, because our life is in Christ. I lift up uh, these people, my brothers and sisters, the people you call your brothers and sisters. And I pray that you would come to the aid of those who are tempted. Um, every battle we face has been, has been fought already at the cross. You've satisfied God with perfection. You've defeated our enemy, Satan, by, uh, by death. And, and you've loved us and brought us into your family, and we rejoice in that. God, I pray for every discouraged heart. Um, that if words spoken today were needed for them, that you would apply them. But really, I pray for your Holy Spirit to be the teacher and for you, Jesus Christ, to be the one who comes and gives aid to those who are tempted. Um, lift us up, build us up, encourage us, and, and remind us again in our hearts, not just our heads, remind us in our hearts at just how forgiven our sins are and just how defeated our enemy is and, and just how glorious heaven is to look forward to. Bless us by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.